Hello and welcome to Technically Speaking, a podcast where scientists and engineers come together to chat about a common interest, share knowledge and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Laura and in this, in this episode I'm joined by Rueda, Amina, Kara, and Antonia to talk about how travel has changed with time and how it has been shaped by society and in turn changed our lives. So to start off with, Rueda, can you give us an example of how travel has shaped your life? First, I would say, as a structural engineer, I always fancy looking at historical structures, precisely bridges. Bridges is one of the forms that changed traveling quite a bit during the history. And I would give like another example on how traveling changed my life is I'm originally from Iraq and I did my PhD in Manchester University. So when I came over to Manchester, my flight took 10 hours. And if I go back in time to the early 1900s, if I wanted to come to the UK by that time, I needed to use the train. And there was a direct train line uh, to London through Berlin. It's called Berlin, Baghdad, but Berlin line. Uh, And that would would have have taken me a few days to reach. So like between a few days to 10 hours is a huge gap in traveling within the time. So innovations in travel have been sort of a time saver for you to make life more efficient so you can focus on what's really important. And Amina, what about you? So my uh, father's side of the family is from Pakistan and my mother's side of the family is from Iran. So my grandparents, they migrated from Iran to Pakistan. And they traveled by foot. And that was quite some journey. So I've heard some great stories, which um, my grandparents underwent and stuff. And somewhere they were taking a train, some places, you know, they were on foot for a large majority of area. And they were sort of like equipping themselves for days worth of travel and stuff. And similarly, and on my dad's side as well, from my grandparents, I've heard stories of them sort of traveling from one end to the other just to go visit someone or something like that. And they were having to do the travel like on on foot. And it's quite amazing. Like even nowadays to get from like one side of Pakistan to get to the other side, the most common form of transport is is rail. And they still spend days um, going from one end to the other and stuff. And then conversely, I've been born here. And for me, I've looked at it a completely different way. So whenever I've visited grandparents, I've always gone on the aeroplane and that happens within a day. So I guess I've always kind of been interested in, in how it's evolved just because of the stories I've heard in my family. Wow, that's, a, that's quite a good reason. Yeah, how it brought your family together, essentially, and what that means to you. Cara, what about you? What's your interest in uh, travel and how it's changed our lives? Kind of similar to what Amma's just said, like those stories you hear about people who've kind of traveled in different ways. I come from Ireland, which is a small island, so you have to travel to get anywhere with a lot of effort. But I also had sailors in my family previously, so I always heard all these stories growing up. And I spent some time living in another country when I was a young, young child. So always these stories about different places. And so the places always fascinated me, but it was always about how do you get there? And so I grew up looking at maps, just being fascinated, like, you know, looking at the maps to see the connections to different places and then planning where you're going to go next. I would always, I still kind of fantasy travel a lot. I have a real thing about trains. So I like seeing where railways go and they go there for a reason because there was a reason they went there before, but they still go there because they're tourist destinations and, you know, what people do you meet along the way? So it's kind of that connection between a map shows you the physicality of what you're looking at, but also like the people that you're going to find in different places. So I say I studied civil engineering and people aren't always that familiar with what civil engineering is, but it's a real mix of different skill sets you have to learn. And in civil engineering, actually, you learn about map making as well as you learn about how to read maps to then shape what buildings and structures you're going to put there and where is the best place to put things. So civil engineering is often like the kind of the big skill engineering you kind of think of. Things don't move, but they have to be located in a place. So I kind of, from a young kind of mind, but also like now from a professional point of view, I still just love looking at a map because it tells you so much about places and how you travel between them. In terms of how it shaped my life, that I guess I still kind of, I still see a map and I still kind of am just like, oh, think of all the places you could go. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I really like maps as well. I spend ages poring over S maps and I still navigate from them where I live now rather than relying on GPS. Oh, do you? Okay, you put me to shame now. I just like them because they're they're pretty. (laughs) It's so much easier to work around a map. If I put things in GPS, like I just get confused. I I literally, I'm the same. I'll open up a map, a good old fashioned way, and I find different routes and stuff. I think it's so much better. Yeah. Yeah, Google does not have that local knowledge. It's definitely more helpful to know what the roads are like around here. Yeah. (laughs) 
That's true. Google might think uh, as the crow flies, but then you actually have to go up a massive gradient and maybe your car actually can't make it up that hill. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Many people have gotten stuck on a pass around here. So I live uh, near the Lake District, so we have lots of very steep, windy, narrow roads. But Antonia, what's your interest in travel and how it's changed our lives? Like Amna, I was born here, but my parents are from another country. And I guess travel's really helped by, I actually, you know, we have technology. I could go on the internet and I could see where they were born, what people are like, you know, according to the to internet and stuff. But it's not the same as when you physically go there. So, you know, I've been lucky enough to actually grow up in a family that can afford to fly abroad, you know, maybe once or every two years going to where my parents grew up and actually experiencing the culture for myself. So it's really nice to have that, but also we've just gone through a global pandemic where we've had to find new ways to experience that and not travel as much. And then there's also on my professional side, having to manage wanting to travel and the necessity of travel, but also the, uh, the environmental impact of travel. You know, there's sustainable tourism. You know, if we, if we all go to the same place at the same time, that can't be sustainable. It just just physically, we can't all fit there. There's um, XKCD's spin-off, What If, where they said, if what if everyone in the planet jumped at the same time? <laughs> and the, you think about, oh, right, yeah, that's 7 billion people jumping. But the actual sort of twist in it was then everyone getting from that point that they all got to. And I think travel is is one of those things that it takes a lot of different different parts to make it work well and that's really interesting you're making me think of you know that um is it jeff goldblum he says we thought so hard about whether we could we didn't think about whether we should (laughs) (laughs) and we've got to a point where we're saying it's great we can all travel so much but we're now all very aware that um it is bad for the planet in a lot of ways so maybe amina maybe your family had it right maybe traveling by foot is the most environmentally friendly thing we should be doing i mean to be honest they didn't have many options did they that was the way that it it was and I think you learn from those kind of things. So after that, even though up until my grandparents were able to, they would prefer to walk wherever they could just because that's what they were most comfortable with. They're like, oh, I take in the countryside. I meet people along the way. I see the birds. I see the trees. I really enjoy it. So why would I do it any other way? Yeah, I agree. I like walking on foot, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the science and engineering. (laughs) So I guess if we go back in time, I suppose one of the things that might have sort of contributed to travel, if we are talking about people walking around on foot, is bridges. And Rueda, this is your fascination, isn't it? Yes, it is my obsession. So if we go back in time, I won't say the first bridge, I will say the oldest bridge is still in use. And that in Arkadiko, Greek, and the bridge is made in the Greek Bronze Age. And that's around 1600 uh, BC, really. When you look at that specific bridge, it's an arch bridge, and you could see all the science and engineering went to build that simple a bridge because the way the arc shape is held on the weight. And it's made out of a stone, which is a local material, sustainability aspect to it. So it's resilient. It have survived quite a bit and is still functioning to our current days. So what was that bridge going from and what was it going to? I think it's just like a smaller bridge connecting to point locally. But I think the, the way they design it, because it's small, so it was sustained and survived that long time. The interesting bit is survived and it, they used local materials and they did not have any engineers, but they had people who think uh, like engineers and they managed to pull it up together in a nice engineering way. <laughs> That's still around. So, so good that it's lasted all these years. Yeah, it's much better than my, many bridges I've seen uh, falling apart. So. <laughs> Looking at the image, I'm guessing it I can't really tell from what's in the picture. There's nothing for scale that has any meaning to me. But is it just like, it looks like a footbridge over a ditch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Taking away, the, making it sound so uh, basic, Laura. <laughs> I know, that's how I roll. <laughs> <laughs> I think... I think that's how all scientists roll. We make things simple so we can understand that in our heads, right? Yeah, do you just, it's practicality, isn't it? I think that's that's where engineering has come from. We need to do X 
action and not quite sure how to do it so you build a path of how to get there it's just as that that's where engineering and sciences stem from yes i'll be like ignore the fancy equation look at my roller <laughs> Yeah, this is how you explain how bridges work with rulers that flex and it talks about uh, tension and uh, compression. <laughs> yes, and I think before I start rumbling about the bridges because I love them so much and I love the engineering behind them, I'll stop myself. I do wonder though, so I live by the sea in one of um, the UK's oldest historic ports uh, called Whitehaven. It was a, a massive trade route in the 17 and 1800s. So I wonder what came first, boats or bridges? Mm. So, uh well, I'll be very technical and historical and sciencey in here and say, according to archaeological findings, uh, uh, dugouts were the earliest form about 8,000 years ago. The first documented bridge is from ancient Mesopotamia. That's all area of Iraq today. And the bridge is about 4,000 years old. So if we compare 8,000 to 4,000, so definitely you could say the boats come first from an archaeological point of view. You might want to disagree, though. Don't know, but I'm not sure whether that's enough evidence for Rita, um, as a scientist, to <laughs> back up your claim that you're making there. <laughs> not that I have evidence either way. Oh, I like the logic, though. It's a very yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> scientific line of thought. It is, it is. I would disagree with that. Bridges probably came before boats, because if you think of like different terrains that every country has, I mean, they'll have a point and I don't know, they'll have a river in the middle and they've got to get from one point to the other. And that might just be their day to day routine. So to me, I think that the development of a bridge would come before the boats in my head because just because I was thinking of different terrains because you might live in a country where it's quite flat and everything's very well connected and stuff or you might be in some mountainous area where I was once as a child and we'd got to a point and we literally had to get from one point to the other point and there was a river in the middle if we wanted to go by car it would have taken us about four extra hours to like go loop around the mountain and get to the other side but just to get to the other side of the mountain where I could see there was this rope bridge and it would have taken me like five minutes to get from one to the other. But man, that was hard. That was hard. It was just a rope bridge and a huge drop over a river, fast flowing. That, that was scary. That's a very valid point, Amina. But your evidence might, ha might have been decayed or burned at a point. That's why we can't find it today. The only reason we can see the bridge because it's made of... Uh, uh, clay bricks yeah sustainable stuff that that would last but that would last i mean the, yeah. the rope bridge like can you imagine what kind of quality rope it was used <laughs> and like when's the last time it was quality check <laughs> <laughs> how much load it can take um, i mean i'm supposed to go on this bridge <laughs> there is one in ireland there is there is but i think this is the previous episode right we spoke more about bridges yeah so i think a lot of this connects with what i was <laughs> going to speak about next which is what I'm really passionate about is connections between things. And that's like building physical connections as well as kind of metaphorical connections and joining the dots. So it's like engineers like to simplify things. I kind of accidentally complicate things in my head a lot more than I need to a lot of the time because I, I don't simplify things enough. Um, but the debate you're just having there is like, you know, a boat or a bridge, which came first, you know, how did you, how, what was the easiest way to connect something or we using a road or using a train? This is all actually the like engineering design process that that's how I kind of see it as a bit different from the scientific process because you need to kind of define what your problem is and the, what's the best solution there's not only one way to do it there's kind of like lots of different ways and it depends on what two places you want to connect um so yeah and I think a example we can do now which is really easy like in, in modern day is you say okay we want a new road it's like okay well what places are you connecting and why how many people are going to travel between those places? Is a car the best way to travel? And okay, do we need a motorway or do we need a single track road? That's the kind of like everyday life that people are living and you need to respond to what that need is and that helps you design what the technical specifications are going to be. So it's making those two connections. So that's kind of how my brain works. I think it's really interesting for me that you were talking about that engineering design process. I love the beginning bit, you know, kind of doing the big solutions. What could we possibly be trying to solve here? And then the end of it, what impact is it going to have? I personally, I'm not that involved anymore in the middle um, technical design. Um, I just kind of come at the beginning and at the end to get all the glory and tell the interesting stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fancy. Carla. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit that I find really interesting, definitely. Yeah, I guess the big question for me is where are you trying to get to? Like, Why would you want to go somewhere where there aren't already people? And in which case, aren't they already connected? But 
maybe they're not Whoa. it depends on whether you're trying to explore something new or are you just trying to connect with more people trying to find a new American <laughs> So the area that I work in now is actually all about um, building new communities. And so this is it within England and England's quite a small place, but in other countries, which are a lot, lot bigger, we've seen this like in other countries where they build a whole new city and in England, they build new villages and towns and you have to build a road in the idea that some, after you build the road, people will come along with businesses and want to build houses. But sometimes you build those roads and no one comes. So you have to, you know, sometimes are you building the road to try and create a connection to open up a new place to people or is actually there is, is there a place existing already which it makes more sense to try and build the best connection to that to connect people who were previously there so sometimes the technology that we have kind of responds to a need of people and sometimes the technology kind of is about opening up new opportunities and it depends which one comes first and as well that's kind of like you know what is it we're designing um i we're speaking about thinking about the cars that we drive in the UK and in Europe. Definitely, the cars tend to be quite small, but that's because we have a lot of smaller roads. We've older cities which have narrower roads that were built historically because they were the width of um, a horse-drawn carriage, and that's what they needed to design for. And so, going forwards, if you look at places like America, which are a lot bigger and have a lot more space, and the roads are wider. They can build bigger car parking spaces. They can build bigger driveways. They have bigger cars because they don't need to respond to the smaller need. That's changing somewhat in the UK and Europe. Is that related to the design of the infrastructure being newer in the US than the Europe? Because Europe is more historical cities. Yeah, so partly because historically we kind of have cities which are very, very old in, in the UK and Europe. And some places, I guess, in Europe, you see videos or photographs with you, like in Italy, where cars don't even fit in the streets. That's why in Italy, maybe they'll drive mopeds or scooters instead not just Italy obviously lots of countries around the world so it's partly that and also partly then deciding what you want to have going forwards if you do have more space for example you can just build bigger places and places which are more spread out yeah and I guess if we're talking about the history of the UK like there are certainly a lot of villages near me from like the 1800s and earlier that have got some really really narrow roads um, like you struggle to get a car down them easily but obviously, before we had cars, we had the horse and cart, but we also had bicycles. And I'm a big cyclist. And what I find so weird about historic cycling is that back in the 1800s, people were riding penny farthings, which to me just seemed like a really weird invention. Apparently, they originated in 1870 and they had that, that huge front wheel connected directly to the pedals, which meant it was called a direct drive. And uh, that meant that you got a, a lot of speed for little pedaling effort, because obviously your wheel rotates at the same speed, but it's got a much bigger circumference. Uh, but it still staggers me that people used to ride those things. Yeah, speaking about bikes, that's making me think of, um, so there's a field that I work in, it's called like socio-technical studies. And it's really understanding how social stuff and technical stuff comes together to shape each other and what is really, really significant. And bicycles are actually touted as like one of the things which were most important for feminism because it gave women a right to be able to travel on their own. And it's still something which is debated in some countries, women shouldn't be cycling. There were a lot of myths around why it was bad for women to cycle, but it then went on to shape fashion. So women were wearing these really long skirts and they couldn't ride penny farthings. But whenever you got the bicycles which were both the same size, women could go on and skirts more easily and then actually that's why they wanted to wear treasures because they were able to wear treasures to use these bikes so it's a, a bicycle is like there's a lot written about the bicycle in terms of how it shaped people's lives in so so many ways but it's just especially as women around the world it really opened up a whole new world to people oh well, i didn't know that so modern bikes were invented in 1985 they were originally known as safety bikes presumably because you weren't as high up as on a penny farthing you were a lot safer <laughs> I wonder how they used to get on it. I mean, what did they find like this certain wall that everyone climbs on top so that they can get onto their bikes? Some of the houses around here and some of the older villages, they've still got those blocks at the front that you'd use to climb onto your horse. So <laughs> I, yeah, I presume it would be the same thing. It's, it's a mechanical horse, I guess. It's a logical progression. And then people thought we can make these smaller and better. So the smaller bikes, the pedals aren't connected directly to the wheel. They're connected via a chain. So it's called a drive chain. And it's the cogs that you use that dictate your speed. So again, you can select your speed more finely. And I think I'll leave it there because I feel like this might be straying into territory on cars, which we were going to get to next. Something that's quite interesting because I drive a hybrid electric car is it's really quiet for one thing. So it's not got an internal combustion engine, but also changing gears is no longer a thing. Rueda, are you starting to? Yes, I did start to learn to drive and I 
passed my theory test a few weeks ago, and I find it really interesting. Lots of the theory test question is about braking and gears, even though like science are moving towards the automatic cars, which I'm tempted to drive here. Oh, Ruth, if you learn the manual, then you can go anywhere. And if you ever get a manual, you'll never forget. But first, I need to, to learn how to cycle. <laughs> That does actually help, I think, yeah. Because when you, I, I can try and explain gears, but I'm so used to doing it on my bike that my fingers just do their thing to change the gear levers. <laughs> That's it. And despite it being opposite of environmentally friendly, learning to drive manual in a diesel car is easier because you can hear the uh, need to switch. Yeah. <laughs> which, again, how do you weigh up your quality of life? versus the environmental impact of learning to drive in a petrol or diesel car. Never thought you'd have to think about, hmm, what's the environmental impact of me learning to drive a manual car? So is it like, which one is better for the environment though? Is it like the full automatic or is it the manual? Oh, that's good. They argue that the um, automatic is because apparently it's better to drive in the higher gears possible and people don't switch up gears quickly enough. How doesn't that depend on how the gearbox has been set up? Yeah, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> people will claim different things. Because also, you then can't coast. Should you be coasting? You're not allowed to coast. Any question with the, with the coasting on the exam, <laughs> say, I'm not coasting. <laughs> um, if, if you're going up the light, you can't coast. So there is also just regenerative braking as well, which does come with electric cars because the way it works is you, if you remember the uh, old motor generator um, cycle, you have, you could either put energy in and then generate an electric field. So if you have your, your wheels turning and you reverse the motor, it will generate the current to be stored back in the battery. But there is also the uh, mechanical way of storing some energy. So you can use a flywheel to store your extra rotational energy when you're braking. And that actually is another way to store energy, which hasn't been as favoured. It's only usually useful for larger vehicles. But if we're talking about whether or not manual or automatic is more environmentally friendly, I think what we should have is regenerative braking because that can save between 10 and 20% of your fuel consumption. How do you ensure that a car actually has that? I think it's a personal responsibility for us to drive uh, without harming the environment. As a consumer, can only can only purchase what is there on the market. So uh, on the market, you know, regenerative braking with mechanical uh, storage is not really popular. It, they've only really integrated regenerative braking in hybrid cars. So again, we go back to this uh, episode we had on the environmental impact of batteries <laughs> in cars. We've talked a little bit about the evolution of the car, right? That we're moving away from combustion engines to just using batteries, essentially. But there's a hell of a lot of development required there. And I think what we're saying is it's down to the consumer to kind of make sure that they're buying something that's been made responsibly and they understand whether it's doing the best thing it should. I think we also mentioned in a previous episode on electric cars that they're not new. The first one was made over 100 years ago. But the difference in those 100 years is that the range and the speeds have improved dramatically, which is down to advances in the technology. Like a lot of people have worked really hard to make these improvements to make it a viable means of getting around. And I guess the next logical progression is airplanes, which also aren't a particularly new technology. But I think there are some interesting things there that merit further discussion. So if you think about a traditional airplane, we all think of a standard shape and we think of round windows. But actually, that's an evolved design. So previously, in like the 1950s or originally when the airplane sort of came out, we used to use square windows. There were two major accidents in air in the 1950s, early 1950s, where the roof just exploded. The top just came off. So, you know, like a traditional aeroplane kind of became a convertible aeroplane. <laughs> <laughs> and what they found through investigation was that because the windows were a square shape, the stress concentrations at the point of the windows were so high that it was creating a weakness and basically the pressures and everything that the aeroplane was being exposed to, it just couldn't handle it. And so that's why they had an explosion. And so then they reformed the shapes and they looked into it. This comes into material science. They found out that if it was a rounded shape, 
then actually you don't have a high stress concentration at any one point. And so that way it became safer. So whenever you look at anything, I mean, if you think of your childhood cars to now, if you think of your childhood airplanes to now, the design is constantly evolving. And sure enough, most of it is to sort of like make it more economical, make it more streamlined, make it quicker. But a lot of these changes have actually been driven from safety as well. And that's just something important to keep in mind, because it is there as a responsible industry. It is there for everybody. Yeah, it requires quite a bit of iterations to get things as fancy as we have them today. And I think in maybe 10 years or so, what we think about as fancy design would be very old and not fashionable anymore. Definitely. So there was this period where we were creating jumbo jets, you know, bigger and better and huge, you know, but actually they're, they're not sustainable. They, they take up a huge amount of energy and they're not as quick as, you know, the smaller ones and stuff. So it, they're not the common sight now, are they? And I think the fashionable bit now is going to space, isn't it? Yeah. So um, we're commercializing space space travel now aren't we so the first virgin galactic has in july been the, they've gone into space and they're making space into like a, a touristic destination i say we're commercializing it as if we're just going to jump on a, a rocket ship and go into space like we do with ryanair at the minute going to spain it's not quite the same level like I have heard a lot of people being like, oh, if I could afford it, I'd love to go into space. I mean, I get the pull. I do. Like, who wouldn't want to see Earth like a little teeny itty bitty dot? I think it's quite cool. But like the, the question will come into the whole social side of things. Should we be doing these kind of things? Should we be? Uh, I mean, it's amazing that we can potentially think about these things. I think considering where we started off from and stuff like little just pods going into space. But should we be doing that? Should we be mining on space, which is the new plan? Sort of like use use space as like a mining place to do all of our dirty work and keep Earth all pristine and stuff. Should we be doing that? I'm also curious. We all come from such different backgrounds and perspectives. Maria, I don't know what you think. How do civil engineers have a role in space travel? <laughs> if there's no roads or railways to build, we have to just stay on Earth and kind of just build a platform for them to land on. That's a boring role for us. I think we still contribute to the space cities because uh-huh. we would need eventually if we keep on traveling there we need a city to be landing to true okay so somewhere and it would be totally different design because the load the weight and the construction will be it's it's, what just imagine pouring concrete into something and your concrete concrete will fly I read something about this, what they're trying to do, they're trying to do modular building. So they're trying to make things here and then send it up and then to uh, to sort of like um, manage with the environment, the extreme environments that they've got. So like extremely cold, the gravity, all of those kind of things, the corrosion, the radiation. Everything is different. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's like modern methods of construction. In my industry, people talk about this quite a lot because it's meant to be kind of more sustainable to have a prefabricated house and just go put it down somewhere so there's less disruption to the neighbors and I don't know there's lots of different discussion around how it's going to be better in lots of ways but I had not thought about the fact that you could prefabricate things to then send into space. <laughs> it's a possibility. Yeah. So like even in the nuclear industry but that's what they're doing they're doing modular building now so the new SMRs which are coming through the small modular reactors that's the whole premise of it they'll do the modular building on a factory site and then go put it down. And here's a good question for the width of the roads. Have you seen them, um, for example, whenever they were transporting the rocket, which came back down and they had to go through all the buildings with like the wings kind of sideways? If you ever drive on the motorway from England up towards Scotland, sometimes you'll see a house in the back of the lorry and it is like two lanes of the motorway. So like, yeah, you might not be able to fit that along all roads or real ways to get to places. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It has to be taken into account. And I know with the small module bills, that is something... So when they were considering where to do the uh, production of the modulars, they were considering the route that they're going to have to take from said place to said destination. And and can they actually even do it? Also now in uh, civil engineering, we have the 3D printing. So they just can set up a 3D printing thing in the space and print the houses in there. You say just like it's a, (laughs) that that would be fine. That's easy. (laughs) From what little I know of 3D printing, it needs to be pretty well refined if you're going to be building a house out of it that's going to last, that has to survive extreme conditions as well. (laughs) And the 3D printer I used, I mean, obviously it was a sort of benchtop thing, but it, it definitely wasn't perfect. There were lots of defects in there. 
we're, we're talking in 50 years. Yeah, true. It comes back to the material science, I guess, that Amina mentioned with the windows and the plane. That was all about the material science. Material science to me is essentially about how the different atoms interact with each other. And it's how those atoms then aggregate on a larger scale to make engineering structures. So you need to get down to your atoms to understand how it would perform over the long term. That's how I think as a scientist anyway. <laughs> you, lo- you love your atoms. <laughs> I do. That's just incredible. I, I think on the scale of like a city and you think on the scale of an atom, like that is so different. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's small for me. You'll see like a steel bar, right? Like just being that everyone will see just a normal steel bar, but like we'll prep it and we'll sort of like prepare it properly, get it under the optical microscope. You can see the grains, you can see how like <laughs> the inclusions are all there and you can see what's stopping the stress. Is coming. It's amazing. Well, I'm now when I see a steel bar, I'll think, well, that's good intention. <laughs> I feel like we're not talking about travel anymore. We've just gone down the very fundamentals of how do you make steel. Uh, maybe we should stop here. <laughs> Cara mentioned this at least once. We sort of came back to it again. You said Jeff Goldblum said um, we we were so intent on doing what we could. We didn't stop to think if we should. Yeah, I think that's the quote from uh, Jurassic Park. I think it is. Exactly. <laughs> so we've, we've gone from talking about travel to material science to making dinosaurs. what we're saying is that society has shaped science and engineering just as much as science and engineering has shaped our lives there are historic decisions that affect what we do and a lot of decision making in um engineering and it's also shaped by material science some of the examples from the conversation were with uh planes and bikes we saw how innovation makes us safer and allowed women to do things which i didn't know and how cars can be changed to reduce our impact on the environment but allowing us to stay connected and as consumers we should also be looking into those technologies and making sure that they're produced in a a way that resonates with our needs for environmental justice or whatever floats your boat a lot of the things we were talking about seem to originate from the Industrial Revolution. And, and that was quite a long time ago. And it sounds like there are a lot of exciting industrial changes happening now, like with the electric cars and with going into space. So I guess that's a good place to end this episode. Uh, so if you've enjoyed listening to this episode of Technically Speaking, you can find us on Twitter to carry on the conversation and keep listening to some of the episodes. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.